Alright guys, I'm gonna start building my hair setup with simple polygon. You can always find it under the object menu on the top. I reduce the polygon dimensions by half down to 50 centimeters each. Skip the triangle checkbox and switch the orientation to minus Y. And that actually is a very important step because eventually we want our chains grow downwards, not upwards. Next I go to simulate hair object and bring add hair. We can see instantly a couple of hair roots appear on the screen. Let's take a look at them a bit closer. Under the guide step I can increase for example length. Let me set this to 500 centimeters just to have something to work with. In this case would be also a great idea to increase the amount of segments because we want to maintain a good flexibility to our roots. And if I try to increase the count parameter, I can see it's impossible right now because of a root which is set to polygon vertex. And as soon as I choose something else, in my case it's going to be a polygon area, I will immediately notice a difference. Okay, for now it looks like we are done with this tab and we're ready to move to the next one. A hair tab might be a bit scary for the first time, especially when you notice 5000 units by default but everything changes when you switch root parameter for as guides. Next we should go to a generate tab to do a couple of things. A render hair checkbox should be turned off and type parameter should be switched to spline because in the end we want spline dynamics, don't we? Ok, next one is dynamics tab which is simply vital for us. We can leave guides as is, but we have to decrease the amount of steps down to 1. Otherwise, we get crazy jumpy madness going on with our hairs instead of real dynamics. And don't forget to compensate this shift with increasing the amount of iteration up to 10. Or to something around. Now, let me take a brief look at what we've done here so far. Seems like everything's fine. And I really have an itching to make some more room here, cause 90 frames is not enough for me. Alright, now it's a good point to dive into some Espresso. Right click on any object of my scene, Cinema 4D Tx Espresso. This brings up an Espresso editor. I simply drag my hair object into editor window. Right click on the empty field, new node, hair, general, hair points. Bring in an object output, then link it to object input of hair points node. And of course we need a few more inputs here. I introduce index and dynamic position inputs. I set dynamic position, can be found on the top of the list. And to demonstrate the whole point, I'm gonna get a null object. You can find it as usual under the primitives menu. I drop in null to editor, go to coordinates, global position, global position. I move my null object a little bit aside in 3D space before I've done anything else. Because right now what I wanna do is to connect the tips of the splines to this null object. And I want to be able to move them as I move this null from one side to the other. Next I connect the position output with dynamic position input. And boom! Nothing happens. And nothing happening actually happens for two reasons. First you want to make sure that in the node tab you set the mode to dynamic guides. If not, nothing will work at all. Ok, the second reason why it's not working right now is concluded within this index parameter. Because as soon as I start to increase it, I will see the drastic change in my spline dynamics behavior. And this parameter tells solver which exact point of the spline I want to connect with my null. And if I want the tip of this spline to be connected with the null, I will have to input 30 as my value here. This can be even more obvious if I toggle between the nearest points. And the amount of 30 comes from the amount of segments in the guide step and it basically represents the amount of sections by which we have subdivided each of our roots. The understanding of this simple idea is going to be crucial 
on the next step. We will be using some Expresso and Python coding in order to bind all of those tips to any object we want. Okay, first I'm gonna make some more room here in the Expresso editor. And as I know, I'm gonna need an iteration node. I'm gonna introduce it by right-clicking on the empty field, going into new node Expresso iterator iteration. Let's jump into iteration node and change the value of iteration and parameter to 12, because we have exactly the same amount of roots. And now this is probably the best time to make some Python script. To do this, I'm gonna right click on the empty field, new node, Expresso, scripts, Python. Let's just briefly adjust the nodes position within the editor. Then I choose my Python node, go to the node tab instead of parameter, and it says, welcome to the world of Python. Okay, cool. By default, we have a simple add expression, input one plus input two, and that's not what we want. What we want is to subtract one from the input one, because we have to take into account the fact that the iteration starts from zero, and then we need to add this value to exactly the same amount of iteration, which represents, again, input 1, multiplied by 30, where 30 is the amount of segments per one root. And now, if I link together iteration output with input 1 of Python node, as well as output 1 and index, we get the result we are after. As we can see, each and only tip of our roots is now connected with null object. And if I pick up my null object and try to move it around, I can see all the tips will follow, which is what we want. Okay, now I have a strong desire to enhance this rig. I want to bind this amount of segments to this Python script instead of just manually input the value all the time because from my viewpoint, this would be rather tedious and boring. So I type in input 2 instead of the value. Don't be misunderstood by this, because as soon as I hit the other notes, everything will crash. At least until I introduce some new data in a hair node. I go to Guides, then Roots, Segments, and I got my new output, which can now be easily connected with input 2 of Python node. Well, congratulations, guys! We have two wins here. First, we successfully restored our crashed algorithm. And second, from this point on, we don't have to mess with our script in case if the amount of segments should be slightly changed. All right, in my opinion, this null did a great job for us. Tell him bye. I'm gonna also get rid of it in Object Manager. Press Delete. And let's go in for matrix object inside MoGraph, a very useful thing which might be a little bit tricky to use for the first time. I change the mode to radial, then I switch the plane to XZ, increase the radius up to around 300 centimeters or so. You don't have to be precise here, because we can always adjust this value later. Okay, let me spend a few seconds choosing a good position to let you see what's going on here. Okay, cool. This time we want to connect tips of our spline, not with just single null object, but with the matrices of our matrix object. And to do this, I'm gonna drag my matrix object into the Expressa editor window. New node, motion graphics, data. I connect matrix and data nodes as objects like this. You can see the node changes its color which is in this case a good sign. I bring in a position output of data node and connect it with dynamic position of hair points node. And boom! Instantly, all of our tips just jump onto one of those matrices, like on a girl. And of course, we can easily play around with this. We can press E key and move it up and down. Press R button to get access to rotation tool. Fall down into matrix parameters and discover that everything of it is animatable. And we can simply imagine the world of possibilities here. But what if I want to populate all of those tips among all the matrices? 
In this case, I will use one more node. New node, Expresso, Calculate Math. Let me adjust the position. And we are about to be ready to switch the mode to Modular. Next, I'm going to set the constant value of 12 as input 2. Connect iteration with input 1. Link the output to index of data node. And here we go. Just take a look at this beauty. Again, we can play with this as long as we want. Because right now we have a fully functioning rig. Take a look at this. Alright, let me show you some more tricks to do. If you jump into this math node within the Expresso editor, you can play with the value of input 2. Once you do this, you can find those steps jumping back and forth between the available matrices. Ok, let me quickly go back to its initial state, which was the value of 12. Another major playground here is the iteration node. By playing this value, we can see each of those steps falling off in its turn. And if you want, as an improvement, you can also bind these parameters together using a constant node. Or maybe something else like a user bar. And if you don't know what user bar is and how to establish it, you can always find it in one of my micro tips. You can do absolutely everything with it. Well, generally, this is it for Express and Python for now. We'll definitely come back here later on in this tutorial, but in general, we've done all the job. And before I forgot, guys, I'd like to introduce to you a very interesting page of a very interesting person. His name is Sam Welker, and I got across to his page when I was searching for some Python scripting or maybe Express, so can't remember exactly. Anyway, he has a lot of gorgeous stuff here. Animations, rigging, Expresso, some Python. Sam Welker. You can find him on the web. He knows a lot of stuff and what's most important in my opinion, he knows how to teach. So instead of getting bored, you get a beautiful piece of information. Sam Welker. Keep an eye on him. Well, and for now, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue the show. Let me close this window, choose a good point to observe, and finally start building our chains. The goal is to simply grow them along each of the routes. I'm gonna start with building a simple chain link. Two simple spline primitives will help me in my beginnings. One of them is circle, and the second one is rectangle. To drop them both on a scene, again I'm using a primitives menu. I set the width parameter to 200 centimeters. Click on rounding checkbox and double the radius. Make a scale a little bit more appropriate with the help of T key on the keyboard. And it's time to use a sweep nerves. It can be found under the generators menu. Let's drop both of the primitives in. Keep an eye on the order. It really matters. Again, T key for the scale. And I'm gonna zoom in, just to see what's going on. To decrease the amount of polygons on the scene, I'm gonna work with spline primitives parameters. And those of you who really watched the micro tips already know what should be done. I go to circle primitive, choose it, and then lock down its panel. Come back to sweep nerves to see the changes, and start to increase the value of angle. About 30 degrees looks quite reasonable for me. Unlock the panel and go down to Rectangle options. I start to change the value of angle and about 4 degrees is ok for me. You can leave it as 5, it's totally up to you. It depends on the look you want to achieve. And bear in mind, it's still parametric, so you can always come back and make your changes. As I brought the cloner onto this scene, I can drop my chain link into the cloner, switch the mode to object, and bring in a hair as my object. And remember, it's only possible because of a spline type under the generate tab of a hair object here. So that's a good thing to know. Now we should start introducing some 
order to this chaos of clones right here. I don't want to waste my resources, so I enable a render instances checkbox. Then I check the distribution to even. They start to behave a bit uniformly. Then I go to transform tab and put in 90 degrees as pitch value. Now that seems to be a better direction. Let's come back to object tab and play with the amount of clones. Count parameter should help us. It's better to turn off the loop checkbox. This will help to adjust the position of last clones. Smooth rotation checkbox will also be useful. And finally, we have to decrease end slider to 1 or maybe 2%. Alright, let's take a look at this from a bit different angle. I'm gonna choose another camera position, make a couple of zoom in and zoom out, and obviously we have a situation here. As we can see, one of our splines is acting like it thinks of rebellion or so, and as for me, I personally tend to estimate this kind of behavior as something inaffordable as well as inappropriate. So, we should find a way out to kill it as soon as it possible. And to do this, I'm gonna choose my hair object, go to the guide step and click regrow. And that's it, it's gone. And that actually is very convenient, because right now we can make another step forward. And that is to bring in a step effector. It looks like something goes wrong again and we shall find the way out of this situation. If I come up to the step effectors options, I will find out that everything works fine according to the properties set. And first, we're gonna get rid of this easy ease spline, cause it's bugging me most. Right click, reset, now it's flat and nice, and we can move to parameter tab. Disable scale, enable rotation, let's try banking, no it's not, let's try heading, it seems to be okay, just in case let's try pitch, no it's not, let's come back to heading, that's our guy, we increase the value and it's not working, but we don't give up and type in manually 15,000, this looks about right, and we add a few more, Maybe 22,000. For my taste, it looks much better now. And if I press play, I can see what's going on. There is still a couple of issues here. One of them is these chain links, which don't touch each other. The second issue is these mass intersections in the center of a scene. Let's see if we can get away with this by reducing a chain link size. Now we obviously need to compensate this by increasing the amount of clones. And I think we do. I think we do can get away with this. I set the amount of clones to 26. In my case it's okay. Yes, we still have a lot of intersections of our chains. But it's possible to work with it. Yes, it's quite possible. And remember, if you want to get rid of any intersections at all, then you gotta go to hair object and set the distribution to vertices instead of polygon area. A few minutes with knife tool and you are done. As for me, I'm going to leave it as is and make a couple of passes with my matrix object. Like this. Beautiful. Alright, let's bring some life into this composition by introducing a MoGraph random effector. This might be a good idea to choose a matrix object ahead of everything. Then I go to MoGraph effector random and we can notice an instance impact. First I'll look for random effectors options. I go to parameter tab, zeroing out X and Z coordinates, switch to Effector tab, choose Noise as my random mode, slow down the animation, 20% of a normal speed should be ok. Right now each of the matrices move along y-axis by 50 cm, and by moving string slider I can control this value on the fly. 
I find this very convenient and for now I'm gonna leave it to around 50% and from my viewpoint it looks about right. So let's move ahead and jump into some modeling section. I'm gonna group everything in my object manager. To do this I'm choosing everything at once, hit Alt G on the keyboard. Now let's hide everything by all double click at traffic lights. It's gonna make them red. I drop a cube primitive into this scene, press C on my keyboard to make it polygonal, enter the polygonal mode, then picking up a rectangle selection, and before I continue, it might be a good idea to disable only select visible elements. Alright, this might be a good starting point. Now I press I on my keyboard, disable preserve groups checkbox, Click and drag with my mouse just a little bit. Let me zoom in to see everything better. And do the same procedure. A couple of times should be ok. And then I press D on the keyboard to get access to extrusion tool. Again I click and drag with my mouse to make an extrusion. Hit I on the keyboard for inner extrusion. Click and drag. Repeat this a couple of times. By the way you don't have to be precise while you are following me. Hit D button on the keyboard, then click and drag to make the extrusion outwards. This time you better keep an eye on the distance, because we are going to need some more room here. Inner extrusion gives us a little bit of intersections, but it's not gonna kill us. Let's do one more, and then I click D to get the extrusion tool. Let's repeat the procedure here a couple of times. We can also use apply button, choosing the correct offset. We are almost done here, let's create a few edges, and that's it. I'm gonna get the hyper nerves, then put this cube into generator. Right now it looks a bit weird, but if we go to generator options and increase the amount of subdivision in editor, you'll see the difference. But you gotta keep in mind that this option has only effect in editor not in render. Now let's move to the front view, because we have some more work to do here. Let's take a close look, grab a rectangle selection, make sure only select visible elements is off, and tolerance selection checkbox should be on. Now we can easily make the accurate selection, like this. Hit delete button on the keyboard, get rid of some unnecessary pieces. And when you do anything like that, you better don't forget to enter the point mode. You will find a bunch of floating points wasting your machine power in vain. Right click on the empty field, choose optimize. Now they're gone. I'm gonna fly in a bit to see the angle better. Gonna choose my loop selection, pick a nice polygon selection, hit delete on the keyboard to get rid of it. Don't forget to access the point mode and click Optimize to delete the useless points. Go back to the polygonal mode, right-click on the empty field, choose Close Polygon Hole, pick up a live selection, choose a new polygon, press D on the keyboard, and make an extrusion towards the center of the object. Let's create a few more edges inside, and let's lift this polygon a little bit higher than the middle line of this cube, somewhere around there. And now, if I turn on the hypernerbs, I will get it nice and round. Again, I highly suggest you to bear in mind that if you want this kind of roundings within your renders, you should keep an eye on this option right here called Subdivision Render. You will always get a nice look, but it does increase your render time. Alright, next we are going to be building a tomb, which we need for two purposes. First, it's always cool to have a tomb in your shot. And second, it's gonna be hiding some of our intersections. And as you well know, if you wanna build a good tomb, you wanna get a good foundation to it. Cube is okay. So let's go change some values here inside the object tab of the cube primitive. Let's change an X size to 330 centimeters, then Y to 120 and leave Z as is. Turn on fillet checkbox and set the fillet radius to 5 cm. Let's adjust the screen and then hit C on the keyboard to make the object polygonal. Let's move to the bottom of this cube, which soon is going to be a tomb. Pick up polygon, then press I on the keyboard, left click and drag with the mouse. 
Let's make a couple of consequent inner extrusions. Like I said again, you don't have to follow me precisely here. Just set your imagination free. As for me, I'm gonna get upwards of the sensor right now. I press D on the keyboard to do this. A couple of consequent passes, then I switch to I key on the keyboard. Click and drag, then D key again to make an extrusion towards the center of the tomb. And that's actually very important here, because we need to hide the roots of our chains here. And that's actually a good opportunity to do this. A couple of consequent inner extrusions, then hit the D key and make the extrusion towards the center to hide the roots even more. And we eventually come to something like this. And it's time to fiddle with the top side. Just a few passes together to mount our tomb. Highlight the central polygon with Life Selection tool, then press I on the keyboard and make a couple of inner extrusions. Then we will go just a few centimeters downwards using D key on the keyboard to form the hollow for placing our text or maybe some logo. Okay, for now just a few more inner extrusions using I key on the keyboard to finish the job here. Okay, cool, it's done. And now it's about right time to form some barrier or something, because we need to introduce some extra geometry here to make it come to life, because right now it looks the way flat. I pick up a loop selection tool within select menu, get the extrude tool and make an extrusion outwards the center. Like previously, I make this set of extrusion, not just one. And now it's time to add some extra geometry to the sides of this tomb. You should press K button on the keyboard to get access to a knife tool. Then you should enter a plane mode, choose XZ as your plane. Then simply double the amount of cuts as well as the spacing between them. Two mouse clicks should do the rest of the job right now. Then I can secretly press U and B buttons on the keyboard to get ring selection tool, make two selections along the cuts I've made. And guess what? Press D key on the keyboard to make an extrusion. Eventually I get something like this and now it's time to introduce a hypernerbs generator. I drop the cube into hypernerbs and I get something much more likely to be a bath rather than a tomb. Now that makes us bring our knife back. Press K button on the keyboard to get knife again. Then go into loop mode. And from this point on, just four tiny cuts will bring us back to our way. Let's finish the job and take a look at what we got here. Let me quickly enable hypernerves to make it nice and round. Observe it from all the directions. And that's about it. We've done with the two modeling section and it's time to introduce some logo or maybe a text. I grab the Mo text, rotate it 90 degrees along Y axis. Again, you can use R key on the keyboard to do this. Right now its axis is aligned to the left and we can easily fix this by choosing a middle position. Now I want to move it a tiny bit upper, so I press E key on the keyboard and change its position using move tool. If I go then to cap step, I can easily turn on fillet caps. And of course, we want to increase the amount of steps and decrease the radius down to 3 cm. Now let's make it a little bit smaller by pressing a T key on the keyboard. Then let's go back to the object tab and put something reasonable to the text field. It's ok, then I decrease a horizontal spacing for 1 cm, press T, decrease the size, briefly adjust the position using move tool, and that's it! This leads us to the conclusion of modeling part. And now we can go ahead and settle it down into this scene. Starting with making the chains visible again. You can feel free to rename this null object into, for example, chains. Then you can bind together more text and tomb objects. All G combination on the keyboard should do a trick. Then I give it a new name. Let's rename this to, for example, tomb and scale the whole thing down. I press T on the keyboard and then observe the whole scene, trying to figure out whether it appeals me or not. Just a few more tiny adjustments and I think 
we are ready to go. Something like this should be fine. According to the next step, we are going to add those metallic head objects into this scene. I make an alt click on traffic lights to make it visible. Going into object mode, I hit T on the keyboard and scale it down, because right now it's too large for this scene. Now it's time to populate them among all the matrices of my matrix object. We can do this with the help of cloner. Let's drop the hat into cloner and see if we can do something with it. Let's switch the mode to object, then put the matrix object into object field, and voila! The only thing that remains is to scale them down just a little bit. Now they seem to be a bit heavy. And it's only a matter of choosing the initial object and scaling it down. And even before that, I'm gonna decrease the subdivision number in editor. We can also speed up our scene by clicking on Render Instances checkbox inside Cloner. Unfortunately, not for long, and you'll see why. Press T and then scale those puppies down. Yeah, that's fine with me. And now I want to introduce a little bit of angular movement to these guys. I want each individual clone to be a bit more shaky, because right now all of them are just staring at the middle of a scene and it's not cool. For this purpose I'm gonna use a random effector, which can be found under Mograph tab. Then I go down into Parameter tab of this effector, disable the position and enable rotation. Put in a random values within 10 degrees in each of those three fields. Then quickly go to Factor step, choose Noise as random mode, enable both of the checkboxes below, drastically decrease the strength parameter, and then change the animation speed parameter to 20%. And it takes only turning the visibility on to compare the results. And now, by moving a strength slider, I can control the angular movement of these clones. And it definitely gives them much more life than they used to have. Okay, next I want to add some real light source, maintain a fall off and distribute it among all the clones. First I turn off my cloner for a moment and then I bring in a simple light source. Let's quickly move it up and place it in front of the object, right where it should be. I should also make it a child of a cloner, and that's quite an important thing to do if I want things to work properly. Next I need to group these objects together. For this purpose I'm gonna use all G combination on my keyboard. As you can see it's gonna bind them with a null object, which I can then rename to anything I want. And now, as you can see, the light became quite dull. It should really be shining the way brighter, but it's not. And it's happening because of a Render Instances checkbox, which we once turned on. And if I come back to the Cloner's Object tab and turn it off, we'll get our lights back. Okay, next I'm gonna do some minor adjustments to the position of this light in relation to the main object. I turn off Cloner, move it to where it should be, somewhere around here, switching a shadow type from none to shadow map soft, set volumetric as visible light, then move to visibility tab, decrease the outer radius to around 50 or maybe 45 centimeters, increase the relative scale in Z direction to 280% to make it look like elliptic or something, then change brightness to 45%. And that's it for now. If I choose now a better angle and then press play button on the timeline, we will see it somehow coming to life, step by step and bit by bit. And for now, let's move to the next part. Alright, now let's talk about some other issues which appeared as we add some light objects into the scene. As you see, there is a dramatic difference between our previous setup and what we have right now. And it's all caused by appearance of light. To fix this issue, we better take a look at the null object, which is cloned by our cloner object. Right now, its center position is calculated as the average between position of our metallic head object and light object. And that's not what we want. What we want is this position to be 
calculated from the center of metallic head object. And if I turn on cloner object to see what's going on right now, I can see that something's changed. And we are right at the place where we used to be. And we can even do a step further. We can put this axis to a place where we would like it to be. And now it seems to be much better. Now we can really say from the most viewpoints that this chain link is somehow connected with the metallic heads we have on the scene. All right. And now, when it's all said and done, I suggest to move out and continue with some animation in Expresso. Right now, we have animated positions of metallic hats. And this animation is driven by random effector, which is connected with matrix object. And if we want to animate rotation of the whole bunch of clones, for example, clockwise or counterclockwise, we can choose one of two ways. First is keyframing, and second is Expresso. And you already know the choice. I make a double click on the existing Expresso tag, make a right click on the empty field, new node Expresso calculate range mapper. A very useful node which might save you from almost anything at any time. I set the outer range as degree, then I go to parameter tab and change the value of 360 to 55 degrees, and it tells range mapper that we only want values from 0 to 55 degrees as our output. Now let's set a new input to matrix object. It's going to be coordinates, rotate, rotation, age. And let's now link it to the output of range mapper. That's all fine, but now we are missing something. And that's the driver to all of these guys. Let's bring in new node expresso general time. And we're probably going to need a new output. It's end. And it stands for end of timeline. And now all that remains is to connect them into proper inputs. We connect time with input and then quickly add input upper as our new input and link them together with output called end. From now on, we can see all of our clones slightly rotate as the time goes by. The whole period equals to duration of our timeline and absolute rotation value equals to 55 degrees. And what's most cool about this is we don't have to always adjust the timings from now on, as in case of keyframing. If duration of timeline is changed, Expresso will adjust the timings instead of us. I hope you find this very convenient, just like as I do. So now, let me tell you a few words about texturing and some materials. Double-click at the Material Manager to get the dummy material. Let's rename it first. I'm gonna call it 3db, as it's going to be responsible for my text. Let's jump into Color Channel and give it a very dark and slightly bluish color. As always, you don't have to be precise with this. Take it as just something to aim for, not something to strictly follow to. Next, let's activate its reflection channel, because this material is going to be highly reflective. Set blurriness to 7%. Basically, reflections are all it's made for. Then jump into specular and change the preset to metal. Let's close the window and simply clone the material. By the way, I use control button to do this. First, I need to change the title. Something like chains does make sense to me. Let's go to reflection channel. Click Additive checkbox, then go to Fresnel Shader. And that's it for this material. Let's clone another one, give it a new name. This one is going to be for Tomb, and I'm gonna call it exactly like that. Let's enable a bump channel, dive into Texture, choose Noise. Let's scroll down into its settings, decrease the global scale parameter to 20%, or maybe even to 12%. We should get a pattern like this. Alright, now let's stop making these materials and let's start signing them to those objects which they need to belong to. Let's sign chain's material to both metallic hat and chain itself. To simply clone the material, I need to control and drag it onto the object I need. Next, we are going to add the tomb material onto the tomb itself. For this purpose, I will find the object in the Object Manager and drag the texture onto it. I do exactly the same thing with my final material. Now let's do some cleanup. 
closing some unnecessary hierarchy, rewind the timeline and put the matrix object just a little bit higher to let those lights illuminating the object. I press play to see the scene in its glance. And that's it for the texturing section. Alright, now let's talk about baking some cash. A very handy procedure which usually save us some nerves and efforts. You simply go to hair object, then to cash tab and click calculate. Once it's done, your cash is baked and you are able to move back and forth along your timeline. A very, very useful thing. And now it's time to prepare our scene to final render. First I group all the objects within this scene into one single group and call it scene. And then I'm gonna cheat and use my rigging solution called HDR Rig Pro. You saw the benefits of using it in my previous tutorials, where I use global illumination to light up this scene, and the presence of separated lighting map and reflection map became obvious. And now since I'm not gonna use GI for this particular scene, I can only use reflection map and one of the HDRs from showroom extension. To fulfill this scene with reflections you so much like in the announcement. By the way, you can always adjust the brightness of them in the options down below. And as always, it takes just a few clicks to do this. For now, I turn off scene by camera checkbox and prepare the scene for the multiple shots. And I start doing this by bringing in some new cameras. We had four different shots in announcement, so we need four cameras to do the trick. Let's get started with the first shot. I jump into first camera and place it somewhere under the tomb. Let's get a bit closer to the branch of this chain. I want to leave the closest part of the chain to the left side of us, because natural rotation movement caused by Expresso will force it to go to the right side of us. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky to find a good position, but we gotta figure something out. We can also use timeline to our advantage, because each position will not be the same as the time goes by. And when you think you've made a good choice, you can measure off around 90 frames and there will be your render time. And it would be definitely a great idea to write this number down because people tend to forget the number. Okay, we established a good angle and range for the first camera, and now we can proceed with the second. I want to briefly choose some corner position and move my camera to the area around some of the clones. This place is supposed to be a good one. We can quickly make some final adjustments, and then we got to figure out the way to connect the position of camera to position of this particular clone. And to tell the truth, to solve this problem, all we gotta do is to make this camera a child of our matrix object. And that's it. I press play and watch the way camera is stick to this clone. Piece of cake, huh? Don't forget to measure off your 90 frames render range. And we've done here. Let's move to the next camera, cause next one is going to be the way more tricky. Let's make all the cameras invisible by double clicking on the upper traffic light of each camera. It's gonna make our life easier, because right now it's a bit difficult to orient in 3D space. Let's fly out a bit and choose a nice, interesting angle for the shot. Let's switch to the physical tab of the camera and play with focal length parameter. You typically want a wide-angle lens for these kind of shots, so that's why you need to decrease the parameter down to around 25 or so. Let's now fly in closer to compensate the effect. Position should be okay now, so it's time to choose a good range of frames to render. Next we need to set up our last camera. This one's gonna be observing this scene from the rooftops. If we can say so, relating to this endless 3D space of grayish nothing. Let's zero out the angles of the camera and then set the pitch value to minus 90 degrees. So now it should be staring vertically downwards. Right click at X and Z coordinates to zero them out. Set the value of around 5000 units into Y coordinate, because we really want this camera to be far away from this scene. Now let's switch to the object tab of the camera again. 
This time the angle is going to be extremely narrow. I'm gonna leave the value of it somewhere around 116. Make a few minor adjustments, like rounding the numbers. And then, of course, I'm gonna measure off a render range. In this final scene I also took around 90 frames, maybe a bit more, but in any case not much. Alright, now it's a good chance for us to fulfill the last scene with magic. I'm going to animate the camera for the last shot with two keyframes. Let's keyframe its current position, it's going to be the last one. Then let's go back through time and move the camera along y-axis. We can also give it a slight rotation value, about 2 degrees. And it really gonna look like a cherry on the pie. Let's make another keyframe right here. And finally press play to make sure everything is looking like it should. Everything's fine for now, but right now we are really missing one thing. And I'm talking about that shaky movement you might notice in the final shot of the announcement. You can simply achieve this by animating your matrix object going up and down. It takes just uh, three keyframes and I really think it's not a problem for you. Just don't forget to recalculate your cache when you're done with this. Simply press calculate button and that's it. Alright, now we are ready for the render and it's a good time to go into render settings. Press Ctrl B on the keyboard to access the main settings. Switch anti-aliasing to best and filter to Gaussian animation. Let's quickly get rid of hair render, press delete because we are not gonna need this. Let's quickly go up to output and change the frame range to manual. Remember I told you to write down your preferred frame range, so now it's the best time to put it right into these two fields. In my case it's gonna be the range between 600 and 700 frames. Keep an eye on the resolution, 1280 by 720 is ok, but you can always make it higher if you want. Then let's enable multipass image and enable a few passes. This time I'm gonna use only material reflection pass and if you really want to learn some more about these passes, you can simply check some of my other tutorials. Now let's click a dotted button, then give it a new name, click save. This will tell Cinema to save our render to the folder of choice. Then I simply copy this path and paste it for the multipass image. As I know I'm gonna play with color adjustments, I'm gonna set the depth value to 16 bits per channel. Enable alpha and straight alpha, as well as compositing project file, including all of its checkboxes. By the way, you don't have to click save project file button. Your folder of choice will contain all the necessary data. Let's just take a brief look at all the tabs we've gone through. Double checking everything must be one of the most useful inventions of all times. All of that looks fine. And now when everything seems to be correct, we can finally render this puppy out by pressing Shift R. And it leads us to logical conclusion of Cinema 4D part. Remember, all the magic comes in post and we'll be using After Effects next to make it come true. For now, I'm gonna stop this render right here and use my previous ones to work in the next part. Alright guys, we're back in After Effects. As you can see, I've already prepared all of my renders. And this time, I'm gonna start with changing the mode from 8 bits per channel to 16 bits per channel. You can do this by alt-clicking the icon. Next, let's drop our render to work area. Keep in mind that it's just a straight alpha and it has no background at all yet. And it means that we need to get some new black solid. Ctrl Y on the keyboard and press OK. Let's put this one below our render, highlight it and introduce some new effect. I tap in ramp in effects and presets, choose it from the list. You can add it to the layer by double clicking at it. First let's change the colors. Let the white color be completely black and black be halfway gray. By doing this we get this gradient, but right now it's linear, so let's switch it to radial. So let's play with the radius of it. Let's increase the Y value of the start ramp to find a good position right behind the tomb. Next, let's enlarge the X value of end ramp. Remember that there is no magic value here, it all depends on your taste. Alright, next I'm gonna create some simple vignette and for this purpose I'm gonna use a new black solid. Ctrl Y on the keyboard, press OK. Let's scale the screen to 50%, then take the elliptical tool, 
I click and drag with my left mouse button to make it grow larger. Press space on the keyboard to move the mask around. I click invert when I think position is fine. Press F on the keyboard for feather. Click and drag with my mouse. This will pretty much soften those edges. Now let's highlight the layer. Press T on the keyboard for opacity. Click and drag and lower it down. You can always click the I button to the left of the layer to instantly see the changes. That looked nice to me. Now it's time to make our material reflection pass working for us. Let's drop it into our composition beneath vignetting layer. Switch the mode to add. And now, obviously, we gotta lower down the opacity because right now the effect is too high. In case of reflection passes, we gotta keep it as low as possible. The value of around 5% should be okay. I can even double the screen size to see the effect better. Now it seems to me that the value of 5% is too much for this particular scene. So I drop it down even to a lower value. Let's try 3%. I toggle the visibility to see the picture better. And now it looks fine to me. And let's quickly close all the layers. I go into background layer, press Ctrl C on the ramp to copy it in buffer. Then I highlight layers all together using shift button on the keyboard. Ctrl Shift C combination allows me to pre-compose them like this. And it's time to start working on the next scene. I'm opening the folder called scene 2, getting the main render out of it. Press Ctrl Y on the keyboard to get the black solid. This time it has number of 3, because it counts all the previous ones. I highlight the black solid layer, then go to Effect Controls and press Ctrl V to paste the ramp effect, which I copied earlier. Now it's just a matter of adjusting our variables. Right now it's perfectly set up for previous scene, and right now we need to make some slight changes to fit it in the new one. Now let's bring some new black solid, Ctrl Y on the keyboard, press OK. Let's put this one under scene 1 layer. Again I'm using ellipse tool to make an elliptical mask. I press space on my keyboard to adjust the position of it. Click invert, then press F for feather. Set the value to around 200 pixels. Press T button for opacity adjustments and lower the value. All your values doesn't have to be exactly like mine. I drop in Reflection Material Pass, change the mode to Add. Sometimes Screen might be also a good option. For now I'm gonna leave it as Add and press T on the keyboard for Opacity adjustments. I'm gonna try the value of 5% by switching the visibility of a layer. I have a sense right now that I can even increase this value for a tiny bit. Let's try 7%. For my taste, this one looks better, so I choose all the layers, press Ctrl Shift C on the keyboard to pre-compose them, give it a new name, and it seems like we are halfway done here. Let's quickly clean up our hierarchy and get busy with scene 3. Again, I drop my main render into this scene, press Ctrl Y for black solid, put this layer to the bottom of the composition, Quickly highlight it and go to Effects Controls, press Ctrl V to paste the ramp effect. Let's give it a few minor adjustments. Now I want to make it look like this light is partially coming from those metallic hats. I can slightly play with position of it to make it fit better. Start color value in this case looks like a brightness adjustments. So feel yourself free to pick up any value you want. As for me, I'm gonna continue with new black solid, Ctrl Y on the keyboard to make it appear. Again, put it on top of the beauty layer. As far as it's a vignetting layer, I'm gonna pick up my elliptical tool and make an elliptic mask. Let's briefly adjust the position of it, then click on invert to invert the mask. Press F on the keyboard for feather. Set the value of around 200 pixels, press T for opacity, lower the value. And that's it for this scene. I'm gonna highlight all the layers, press Ctrl Shift C on the keyboard to precompose them, give it a new name, scene 3, and finally press OK. Alright, before even getting started with our scene 4, 
let's change our composition's duration. And to do this, I'm going to right click on the empty field and then go to composition settings. A pop-up menu will appear and there will be an option for duration. And I'm going to change it to around 400 frames. Let's click OK and then extend our timeline to full duration of the composition. I drag these layers while holding shift button to constrain them to each other. I'm gonna make them all invisible for now, because I don't want anything to hamper me while I'm working with my final scene. I go to the project window and drag my render into the composition. First I'm gonna cut some of the frames down, because I was first too lazy to double check my dynamic simulations before rendering. And second, I was twice too lazy to re-render this after I've realized that things not the way they should be. So the first and main idea to learn from this tutorial is always. I said always, guys. Always double check things before you render something. All right, now I finally cut those frames down and press Shift Control C to pre-comp this layer. I press OK and then I double click at this pre-comp to enter it. Unfortunately, I need to repeat the procedure, so I cut those frames down using the same technique. And then I press Ctrl Y on the keyboard to bring black solid. Of course, we also need to cut down this layer. And this time we're going to trim the comp with the slider right under the timeline. Now, if I want to paste my ramp effect into effects control panel, I will notice that the buffer is empty right now, but relax, we can always choose it from the panel. Again, I'm gonna invert the colors, let the white color be black and black color be gray. Let's also switch the ramp shape from linear to radial and then play with its position values. Because this time we probably want the light to be right in the middle of the screen. I want the radius to be just a few pixels more than the clone's position and the brightness of this light should be a bit less than it is right now. Alright, now let's do some vignetting again. Ctrl Y for black solid. Click OK, then go to upper menu for ellipse tool and do an elliptical mask. Somewhere around here should be OK. Then invert the mask by clicking on the checkbox. Press F for feather and drag it until it looks good. Then press T for opacity and leave it somewhere around 15%. And now it looks like we've done with this pre-comp, so it's time to move back to our initial composition. Let's prepare the composition for some adjustments. I'm gonna move my pre-composed scene 4 to the tail of the composition, make all the layers visible again, then right-click on the empty field, Composition Settings, change duration to 365 frames, and this will lead us to Overall Effects section. Let's do some cleanup and spend a few seconds to rename this scene. You can always rename your layer by highlighting it and pressing Enter button on the keyboard. Now it's time to bring a new solid, press Ctrl Y, again press OK. This one's gonna represent the overall vignetting. To make a quick mask, this time I'm gonna use a pen tool. You can find it at the top, right next to ellipse tool. Then I randomly click with my left mouse to complete the mask. Then I press F for feather and do a slight feathering. Press T for opacity and make it lower. Again F for feather to make it around 200 pixels. And the reason why we cannot see anything is just a frame we are currently staying at. Now it's better. Alright, that's fine. And now it's time to do some color correction. Press Ctrl Alt Y to get new adjustment layer. Press Enter to rename it. I call it CC for color correction. Just because I started, I'm gonna rename the black solid layer too. Then come back to adjustment layer and bring in an effect called curves. Let's just type in curves and double click on the effect. This time I will use only RGB channel and I'm gonna give it a slight S curvy shape. You can always check the difference by clicking on FX icon. And finally, I'm gonna introduce a hue saturation effect which helps me with my final tunings. 
by default it's gonna be added right under the curves and it's just a matter of dragging it on top to restore the proper sequence let's reduce the saturation value by a third and that's it guys now we only need some motion blur to prepare this scene to final render let's get a new adjustment layer call it rsmb for real smart motion blur it's an external plugin and it's simply the best so it's worth having it Let's double click on the abbreviate and this is where all the magic comes from. Default value gives us a brilliant result. And you can even take it to the next level by introducing some motion vector paths from Cinema 4D. In that case you will have to set them up separately for each scene. And it shouldn't be a problem because the eventual result will overcome all the expectations. Ok, I've gone ahead and pre-rendered this composition and we can finally compare the results I had in my previous render and the ones we have right now. As you can see, they are really pretty much the same. So, we've done a good job today, guys. Played a lot with the Spline Dynamics module, went deeply into Expresso, we even had a little bit of Python scripting today. We even gone through some simple modeling techniques, which allowed us, rather quickly, to prepare some simple objects to our scene. We also made some simple texturing and lighting, rendered our project using multipass, and finally spent a few minutes with post. Like I said, guys, we've done a good job today. And if you really believe it's already a 3rd of January on the calendar and no one else will wish you a Happy New Year yet, then it's definitely not your case. Happy New Year, guys, and wish you luck. Truly yours, Alex V for 3D Boom.